Welcome to Faith and Science. My name's Dr. John Ashton, and I would like to talk to you uh, today about a topic that gives me great concern, and that is the number of people who are giving up their faith in God because they believe that science has essentially proved that the Bible is not true, that uh, the origin of life is evolution, and of course the Bible says that we were uh, created. And this, uh, as I said uh, just a moment ago, is of great concern to me because in actual fact we have overwhelming evidence for creation. However, this is really being uh, suppressed out there. The evidence for creation is being suppressed. And most scientists and science educators today will have been inculcated with the uh, the, uh, idea of evolution, uh, that evolution is is a fact, and they they haven't questioned it. They they haven't looked at the alternative um, aspects of the origin of life. They haven't actually looked at the issues the, uh, that evolution uh, now faces. Now, I'd like to uh, highlight this uh, with some incidents that happened uh, 10 years ago now. Uh, in 2006, a, uh, an article was... Um, well, actually, I think it might even go back earlier than that to... 2005. In 2005, there was a DVD circulated to schools, um, and a, I forget the exact title of the DVD. It was something like Life's Tiny Mystery, or uh, uh, but it was about life, and it was essentially a DVD putting forward the evidence for intelligent design, that the amazing creation that we see around us today uh, the the flowers, the, the birds, the insects, the amazing little bacteria, the corals, uh, all the different forms of life that we have uh, just overwhelmingly point to intelligent design, the fact how, uh, how e- ecosystems work. And there was a, a large outcry by uh, certain biologists at that time in 2005 that led to the Biology Teachers of Australia publishing uh, full-page advertisements in national newspapers across Australia uh, warning schools or advising schools to not watch the DVD, that it was not uh, approved by the uh, uh, Biology Teachers Association of Australia. And in uh, January um, 2006, uh, Maggie Spensley discussed uh, uh, a number of issues about uh, the intelligent design uh, issue in uh, the journal Chemistry of Australia, uh, Chemistry Australia. Now, this uh, journal is the official journal of the Royal Australian Chemical Institute. And I remember reading... uh, part of this journal where uh, uh, Maggie uh, Spensley quoted uh, a a professor from the uh, University of New South Wales and essentially his argument was that if we allowed intelligent design to be taught in schools or evidence for intelligent design that that would open the door to teach such ideas as spoon bending and alien abductions and Uh, flat earth theory and astrology and I thought to myself this this is this is so wrong there is overwhelming evidence for creation Um, there is uh, an enormous amount of evidence for intelligent design in my view and so therefore I decided to write an article and submit it to uh, Chemistry Australia. And uh, my article was uh, published in the April 2007 uh, issue of uh, Chemistry in uh, in Australia. It was titled A Creationist View of the Intelligent Design Debate. 
And I set out the arguments in that uh, article. It was a peer review article. It was actually um, published as a feature, a feature article in the in the journal. And the subtitle was not all scientists accept that Darwinian evolution was responsible for the diversity of life on Earth. Now, when that article came out, a number of scientists um, uh, protested and they wrote to uh, Chemistry Australia, to the editor of Chemistry Australia, and said that, um, you know, this, this article shouldn't have been published. And, in fact, the, the editor in the May issue, their letters are published in the May issue of uh, Chemistry Australia, and the editor published uh, an apology. But when you read his, his apology, in fact, I, I believe that he... Um, he, he again misunderstood or, or, or misread some of the um, arguments that uh, I had raised. And so, uh, again, um, I'm very interested in people looking at the actual data and you can um, read those articles online. I think um, they're, they're available. So uh, it would be the April edition of Chemistry Australia 2007 and the responses are in the uh, May uh, edition of um, uh, Chemistry Australia. But it's interesting, uh, the, the scientists that wrote in, uh, three of them, uh, three of the letters uh, were published and essentially they uh, say that the arguments that I presented have been debunked uh, that uh, other scientists had demonstrated that um, the the evidence for creation had been disproved and so forth, but they didn't cite any references. They they didn't quote any any references um, for those arguments, and it's very interesting that later in two double o seven, a a philosopher in uh, at Rutgers University in the United States. Uh, Dr. Jerry Fodor, published an article called Why Pigs Don't Have Wings. And he raised some of the issues that I raised, that in actual fact there's no known mechanism for how evolution can occur. There's no known mechanism for how the new genetic code can form. Now, by the way, if you uh, again want to uh, check... Um, some of these things that I'm saying online and the issue about my article, the debate about my article that occurred uh, back in 2007, if you just Google the words chemists in a stew and my name, Dr John Ashton, uh, you will see uh, summaries that come up about that article. So that's just Google chemists in a stew. But I thought it was very interesting that Foda again pointed out exactly the same Things. And in fact, uh, the following year, in 2008, um, uh, 16 of the top evolutionists in the world met at um, a research institute in Austria, uh, at Altenburg, and, um, and they discussed these, this major issue that had been raised by Fodor, I believe, um, that there actually isn't a known mechanism for how evolution could occur. And yet these scientists that wrote in to Chemistry in Australia and indeed the editor when he apologised, I believe that there was evidence. Now, how do we, how do we solve this issue? We, well, we need to actually look at the facts and it's very interesting that those scientists when they responded in Chemistry in Australia did not actually quote any sources. They just made assertions. They just... Um, made assertions that I was wrong, that the material that I was presenting was incorrect. Even though, in my article, I provide 10 sources, and many of those sources are references to internet links, so again, you can look them up easily. You can check my data. And that's what I'm very interested in, that people check the data. When we check the data, in my view, the evidence is overwhelmingly in support of intelligent design and creation. 
It's interesting, too, that um, the, uh, a journalist, Susan Mazur, M-A-Z-U-R, uh, did uh, interviewed some of those top evolutionary biologists that uh, met at Altenburg in 2008. And if you Google uh, Susan, Mal- uh, Susan Mazur, Altenburg uh, 16 on YouTube, you can actually watch some of the interviews where she interviewed some of those scientists and uh, some, you know, they, they talk about a lot of things and they skirt around the issues. But if you watch the interviews carefully enough, um, you will see in the end they um, point out, well, you know, we're not sure we really don't have a, an explanation for evolution occurs, but we believe it happened. In fact, um, as I recall, Jerry Fodor is, is interviewed and he says, uh, well, I don't think anybody knows how evolution occurs. <laughs> but yet this is being taught in our, in our schools. Um, another situation arose, of course, just after this in uh, 2010. Um, the uh, uh, Israeli's education ministry chief scientist, Dr. Gabriel Avital, uh, sparked a furor among local university academics when the newspaper uh, Haaretz, a uh, Israeli newspaper, reported him encouraging students to critically examine the evolutionary teachings imposed upon them. So here is one of Israel's top scientists, and we know that um, you know Israel and and uh, you know has very very high academic standard there a very, very clever uh, uh, group of people and a uh, very, very clever culture. I think uh, more Jews have won Nobel Prizes than any other uh, cultural background uh, so, uh, group of people. And what um, uh, Dr Avatol went on to say was this. He's quoted as saying in the newspaper, if textbooks state explicitly that human beings' origins are to be found with monkeys... I would want students to pursue and grapple with other opinions. There are many people who don't believe the evolutionary count is correct. And in an earlier interview, um, Dr Avital had said, another scientific field that is problematic is biology or life and environmental sciences. When your doctrine is based on Darwin's theory of evolution and its implications, you are standing on unreliable foundations. So here we have one of Israel's top scientists coming out publicly and making those statements. So that's uh, back in uh, February 2010. The result? He was sacked. So that's the sort of situation that um, is is occurring. So just as... Um, uh, you know, these other scientists, uh, for example, attempted to um, uh, point out that my article shouldn't have been published. And in, in fact, at the time, it was the April edition of Chemistry Australia that came out in 2007, and it came out just as Easter time. And the editor told me that they, uh, when I rang him about the article, he told me that um, they held an emergency meeting, they were called in, um, and they held an emergency executive meeting over Easter and they decided to delete my article from the electronic version of the journal. So um, it was deleted for a while. It has since been restored, of course, and you can, can read for yourself. And, of course, they couldn't recall the hard copies that went out to libraries. But I think it's very important to work with the real data and to look at the evidence. And it's fascinating that people are trying to close down the evidence. Um, and, and another situation that I had a um, couple of years after that was I was uh, meeting with uh, some scientists at uh, uh, a university that would be ranked uh, certainly in one of the top universities in Australia. And this was in the area of uh, uh, plant breeding. And... I, I was thinking about this, um, the claim that evolution has, that mutations produce new genetic information. And 
I thought, you know, I, I will see, you know, what the experts uh, say. Now, there was a professor there who, I say, um, a world-famous plant breeder. Breeder? Well, well certainly um, uh, has a, an international recognition as a as a plant breeder, perhaps world famous is a bit strong. <laughs> but, um, yes, he would be a, a leading Australian researcher in this area. And we were we were having lunch. We were sitting around a number of academics uh, at the table. And uh, I asked the professor, I said, um, do, do uh, mutations produce new genetic information? And uh, he said, oh, yes, yes. And I said, can you, um, can you give me an example and he thought for a moment and uh, he said, oh, I said, I, I can't think of an example offhand, but ask uh, so-and-so um, uh, when you get back uh, in, the, in the research centre. He's up on the second floor. He's our uh, senior geneticist. Uh, he'll, he'll be able to help you. So after dinner, I uh, had the opportunity to, uh, in a few moments, uh, pop upstairs and uh, and meet this uh, researcher, had a chat to him, he was very friendly, and asked him the same question. And his answer was the opposite. He said, no, never. It uh, never produces mu- mutations, cause a loss of, of information. He said, I, I don't know of any example of mutations producing new viable genetic information. So this, again, was a, a, a real eye-opener. Now, the other... Um, Scientists who were sitting at the table over lunch. No one, no one corrected the uh, the, the the senior professor there uh, that mutations can produce a new genetic code. So I, I assume that they also assumed that that is the case. But the evidence that we have to date is that I don't know of any proven example of. Uh, mutations producing new significant code that works. And this is a, an important requirement for evolutionary theory to work. I mean, that, that underpins evolution. Now, one of the reasons that I'm talking about this is, um, as I was trying to say when I, I started off, that many scientists... Uh, study science, they, they go through our high school system, our university system, they learn about science. If they're doing the bio- biological type sciences, they learn about evolution and they assume that it's correct. But they haven't really challenged the principles and it seems that there's a, a massive ever, effort to close down anyone who is challenging those principles. So when we go back to 2005, when that DVD was circulated, again, this effort to don't show it to the students. And this is why with the information that um, I'm saying here on this program, I want to encourage you to check what I say for yourselves. Because really, it, it's, a, it's a life and death matter, eternal life and death matter. God created this world, is what I believe, and he has a plan for us. Last episode of Faith and Science, we talked about the mind and where do thoughts come from and that there is you know, really no scientific explanation for the origin of thoughts. When you, th- when you think about it, even the claim that evolution produces mutations, mutations are chemical changes. You know, some people say to me, John, you know, how, how can you uh, talk in this area? You have no authority to talk in the area of creation. You're a chemist, uh, an industrial chemist, a research chemist. But the, the th- mechanisms of evolution are pure chemistry. Mutations are a result of chemical reactions. The, the, the mutations have to obey the laws of chemistry. And the laws of chemistry act on molecules. These are inert substances. So the origin of the mind and the origin of thoughts, because as we uh, discussed in the previous episode, thoughts are non-material, 
How can the origin of non-material things be explained by mechanical processes underpinned by chemical reactions that obey the laws of chemistry? And this is another interesting fact that has been pointed out in, a, in another book recently uh, by Professor Thomas Nagel. Now, he's a professor of uh, philosophy at the University of New York. And he uh, put out a book in 2012 titled Mind and the Cosmos. Why the Dar- And the subtitle goes something like this, Why the Darwinian Paradigm must ultimately be proved false. And again, following on, he has grasped the concept that there's no explanation for the design in nature. There's no explanation for the origin of the complex DNA code and the code reader system. And there is overwhelming evidence for the existence of some intelligence behind this, some mind behind the cosmos. Now, he's an atheist. He doesn't want to go as far as accepting the concept of of God as such. He he wants to still work in that um, mechanical framework, in this uh, naturalistic framework. But uh, it's a very, very interesting book. Again, And so here we have these leading thinkers like Jerry Fodor and Thomas Nagel again pointing out that evolution doesn't make sense on the basis of what we know today. The, the mind is, a, is, is an amazing thing and our, our thoughts and, and where our thoughts come from as, we, uh, as I mentioned last week and the origin of design. Uh, and inventions, and the con- the the opposite, the the consequence of the origin of evil. But as we read the Bible, the we we read about this conflict between good and evil, and that God, our Creator, has a plan for us to to spend eternity with us. I think the the difference is with the the people who are trying to knock belief in God, remove. God from the classroom, haven't actually experienced God. They haven't experienced God talking to them. They haven't, they haven't experienced that impression that there's something influencing my mind. There's a thought that has come. This thought has come from outside somewhere. I've had some experiences like that. I, I remember a time when uh, my wife had uh, uh, gone up to uh, visit her parents at Christmas time, and she'd left early to get the cheaper airfares. We were living in Tasmania at the time, and I had to uh, finish uh, work. I was uh, lecturing at a large institution in in Tasmania, tertiary institution, and uh, I finished uh, when I finished work. One, we had an old car at the time, and before leaving, I decided to check under the car and to uh, to to service it. And while I was under the car, uh, I had a distinct impression I needed to go and do something else, and it was really, really strong. It was just nagging me, and so I got out from under the car to walk over to do this thing that I this thought was saying, I must do that now, and the car rolled off the jack. Now, it was a silly thing to do, I guess, work under a car, just jacked up at one, but you know, I was young, I didn't think about those things. But I think if I hadn't have got out from under the car at that time, it was a big, old American car, <laughs> that's what we could afford at that time, and... I would have been seriously injured if not killed. And what was worth was we lived on a small acreage. There were no neighbours nearby at that time. I, I could have yelled and screamed. No one would have heard me. And, you know, I praise the Lord. As I look back on that, God saved my life. I believe God put that thought, that nagging thought in my mind to get out from under the car. Um, I didn't have the thought that the car was going to roll off the jack. I just had the thought to get out and do something else. It's interesting where these thoughts come from. I remember another time, um, some years later, we'd built a, 
a uh, new house. We're in another suburb now. Uh, I still had the same position lecturing, and I had an evening evening lecture. And uh, so that gave me some time off during the day and I was using that at home. And as usual, I used to, not a good habit, I, I must admit, but I would leave home with really just enough time to get into, um, to give my lecture. On this particular day, again, we'd had our children, we could only afford a, an old car, it was a Layla Marina. And I guess they were really a joke car. <laughs> Uh, people made jokes about them, but uh, this was a little car that uh, I used to commute the 16 kilometres into work. And uh, I was travelling along the freeway, suddenly saw steam coming out from under the bonnet, and I thought, oh no, what's happening? And I pulled off the, the road, jumped out, opened the, the bonnet, and there steam was pouring out of the upper radiator hose. And... I thought, oh, no, you know, how am I going to get to work now? And the thought crossed me, hitchhike now. It was just such a strong thought, hitchhike now. And just standing there in front of the bottom, I just held my hand out and the neck, there was a car coming at speed along the freeway, but he saw me and he pulled over and stopped. And I asked him, I said, uh, can you give me a lift into Hobart? And he said, yeah, sure, friend. And, uh, you know, what's the problem? I said, oh, I've got to burst up a radiator hose. And he said, oh, we might be able to fix it. And I said, oh, well, I don't think so. The, the hose is split. And he came over and looked at it. He said, I think I might have a hose. And he walked back to his car, opened the front passenger door, and there on the floor were a pile of radiator hoses. Now, the Layla Marina upper radiator hose had a vulcanised T-piece in the radiator hose, right, for the heater. It was actually part of, it was a, you know, a different system to most cars. Believe it or not, he had a hose the right length with a vulcanised T-piece on it. Within five minutes, we had the new hose on the car, found some water in a little creek nearby, topped it up, and I was on time for my class. Where did that thought come from? To hitchhike now. Why? How many cars in the universe drive around with a pile of radiator hoses in the front passenger seat? I always remember that. There are many encounters that that God is real, that there is a, a power that loves us that is real. And one of the things that uh, I am so passionate about is that we find and learn about that God and get to know that God which is described in, in the Bible. And so I would encourage you to read in the Bible. Don't be put off by the teachings of evolution in the science classroom. There are many scientists that see the flaws in that. You've been listening to Faith and Science. I'm Dr John Ashton. Have a great day. been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.